It is my belief that you should breed ball pythons. And I'm going to tell you how, and more importantly, why. And before we get into that, I've got some updates to share with you guys. If you want to skip ahead to those, there are chapter markers down below. If you can click anywhere in the video, I made it, laid it out nicely. Everything that happens within this video, you can just click on that below if there's a certain thing you want to know about, whether it's temperatures, your breeding room, incubation, um, ultrasounding, uh, how to sell your snakes afterwards. I just there's all, all those notes will be down below. But I've got some updates I wanted to go over with you guys first. Again, if you're just here for how and why you should breed ball pythons, all those chapter markers, one click away down below. And I'm going to have beautiful footage right over here happening the whole time. I'm going to be explaining it in little notes. It'll be it'll be wonderfully, beautifully edited, cinematic masterpiece. Hello! Top of the morning, friends and family. I apologize in advance. I brought you in here late. We've already done a lot this morning. Uh, I wanted to bring you along for most of the day, like we're going to start doing on the long cinematic edited vlogs. But, no, what have we done this morning already? Uh, we went fishing and went on a run. We've already been fishing and on a run. I don't know why I had to say that. He just told you. Uh, next time I'll start right at the beginning. I'll, I'll start the camera as soon as I pick my head up off the pillow and we'll really bring you along for a whole day for real instead of missing out stuff. I can't sit down on pink. Pinky. Noah and I are just going to clean up in here in the snake room and go through some snakes and then we're going to uh, check these out. You ever see snake eggs before? If you haven't seen snake eggs before, they start out soft and leathery and then if they sit for a little while and dry out, they go like this. Isn't that fun? So a couple things we're going to talk about today. Uh, Leia and chocolate. If you've been following along, snake, chocolate. We're going to talk about chocolate and Leia. We'll get there. Is one still in shed or did you collect the shed? I uh, did not collect the shed. He might not have shed out yet. Yeah, it doesn't look like it. He's, not he's alive. <laughs> <laughs> what? Do you know? I know blend. What about blend? That blend is a blood python. Um, he is a male. Uh, he is in shed, I believe. And I named him Blend because his colors mixed together. That's all I know. Can I hold the dead snake that's in there? There's not a dead snake in there. See, when the snake died, we fed the snake. There's no more dead snake in there. Can I hold the someone in that red box? Hey, Are you going to pick one up or what? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to hold this box all day long, Missy. I is this an albino? Okay, we need to, Leah, let no one I need to clean snakes, okay? And this is part of our talk of what we're going to talk about with chocolate. Uh, is chocolate Leia's snake or your snake? But like Leia's favorite snake? Or is chocolate? <laughs> so many questions. All will be answered. <laughs> To I'm going to name this snake garlic. Garlic? Like you eat? Like that kind of garlic? It's color seems garlicic to me. Garlicic? Colored of garlic. Garlicic. All right. All right, let's do this, Noah. Paper towel, boy. Just, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm apologize. You look like a, a bad mom on the vlogs. You're just always going to get your hair done. <laughs> well, we gotta fix this tiny little spot right here. She messed up. You guys missed the part where she cleaned up a dog's poopies for twice and cooked breakfast and did the hip hop dance routine with me this morning that she didn't want to film. Hip hop dance routine workout. Oh, missed it. Sorry. Could I please hold chocolate? All right. So here's the deal with what is going on here. Here's the deal with uh, Leia and chocolate and what's happening. So I had chocolate up on Morph Market available for sale. 
and somebody inquired about it. And I knew that I would maybe say, you know, something. Well, I told the guys, like, there's somebody else that's interested in this snake. Yeah. I'm still interested. I told her, I said, I said, we can keep chocolate, but you have to take care of him. You have to come down here and feed him and make sure he has water and clean <laughs> his poop. And what did you tell me? What did you tell me, Leo, when I told <laughs> what did you tell me when I told you that you have to clean up chocolate's poop? So, are you going to clean his poop? Um, I guess so. No, oh, yesterday she said, "Okay, I guess it's okay if we sell chocolate." That's what she said yesterday. All right. Well, we'll still be in the we'll still be in the uh, probationary phase, I guess. To see if we end up keeping chocolate or not, depending on Leia's willingness to clean poop, like this guy. You got cherry juice on your face. I know. Uh, uh, speaking of speaking of chocolate, uh, speaking of snakes on Morph Market, for any folks that ever are inquiring about snakes to anybody anywhere whatsoever, if for some reason things change and you're not interested in that snake any longer, communicate that to the person that you've been talking with, just so that we know that you're not dead or something. You know, it's, it's common courtesy, I think, just to not just drop off the face of plants. Fine, if you change your mind about wanting a snake, that's that's totally cool. What's not cool is just pretending like either A, you disappeared or I disappeared. We didn't disappear. We can still say, oh, hi, sorry, I'm no longer interested. Just do that. Just for anybody else out there that's ever interested in snakes, change your mind. Just let the person that you've been talking to know so they stop bothering you or they don't ask you and they know. So we know. You know communication. It goes both ways. Just say sorry. Or not sorry. Or just, I'm not sorry, but I'm not interested any longer. Leave me alone. Stop wondering if I died. Well, what's that? I guess I missed a spot. It'll be fine, we'll get it. It'll be fine? No, you'll take him back out and you'll get that spot. Teach him right, man. This kid's getting paid. I'm not paying you to do a bummer of a job. You gotta do it right. Eggs are looking good in there. Pretty good, no Sage. You're doing, doing a good job. I, I'm sorry that I was in my underwear the whole time. I just kind of realized I was hot. I was hot, and when you're hot, you just don't think about stuff, and you just do what you can to stay cool. I'm gonna take a shower. We'll get right back with you guys. Everyone, I'm letting you know, don't mess with a horse. Oh, I'm gonna walk the poop down. See, see the difference? What do you know? Clay dinos. What about clay dinos? Um, clay is fun to make and dinos are cool and that's all I know. See a little girl over there? She's making me some custom treats. Custom treats just for me. Here's a little sneak peek of some of the treats she's making for me. I mean, it's it's okay for you guys to be a little, a little jealous, I think, in this situation. I mean, every now and then you get a little jealous of something and... It, it's just true. We're human, and I know you're jealous of my treats. It's all right. You know, I'm I'm willing to share. But you gotta be here. Hard at work, keeping her daddy happy as a clam. Watch out, Captain Doofy. Hello. As much fun as I'm sure it is for Leia, I know it's fun for Leia swinging on the swing, and it's definitely fun for me. I'm not sure exactly how fun it is for you guys watching, so what I've decided we're gonna do, and I probably mentioned this at the beginning of the video, but I'm gonna talk about why you should breed ball pythons 
in my opinion, and how I do it specifically. And we're going to do my little podcast setup here. I got this nice podcast. This is where I've been podcasting from recently. Oh, wow, it's so dark. Um, I've been podcasting from outside recently. I just found it's been nice to be able to have a cigar and stuff. But my little outdoor spot, look, it's nice. It's simple. It's not elegant when you look at it like this, but when you're actually just seeing what I let you see on the screen, then it's, it's pretty nice. So we're going to do that. Um, first, well, no, let, let, let's sit down with the podcast thing. We'll, we'll go over it. All right, so now that we're here, let's talk about first the why you should breed ball pythons. And this is going to be strictly my opinion. When we get to the how, it's going to be the facts of how I do it, because I was specifically asked by somebody if I could please show the specifics of how I breed ball pythons from beginning to end. And there's two simple whys you should breed snakes, in my opinion. Ball pythons, snakes, breed any animal for that matter. You love that animal. You love snakes. You love ball pythons. If you don't, you definitely should not breed them if you don't love them already because it's a lot of work, there's a lot of heartache involved, and if you don't already love them, if you don't love them, I mean love them, you're going to fail. It's going to hurt and you're going to just don't do it. That's my opinion. The second part of why you should breed ball pythons is because you want to make more. You want there to be more on the planet. You love them so much, you want there to be more. If you feel like me, you want there to be a ball python in every home across America, across the nation, across the world. Every home. A ball python for every home. That's as much sales many speech as you're going to ever hear from me. Every, every, I foresee every home in America will have a ball python. I mean, I, I do. I, snakes are so misunderstood. I'd love to see more and more people accept them for what they are, which is another beautiful part of God's creation and not something to be feared, afraid of, or reviled. Should be revered along with dogs and cats and all the other animals that we've brought into our lives as humans. And that's it. That's my two-part thing as far as to why I think you should breed ball pythons or any other snake or animal. Notice I didn't say anything about making money. If that's your reason, that's, that's why I left it out. That's not why. Firmly believe that if you go into that as your why, I'm not going to say that you will fail, but I want you to. <laughs> Let's get into the how to breed ball pythons. And this is, again is, is how I've done it. And I have been successful with it. You know, if we, if we do want to talk on the financial thing just for a, a tidbit, I will, which is uh, I, I am in the profit margin. As much as this has been a, a hobby for me, snake sales have brought in more than I've put out into everything, whether it's caging, new animals, et cetera, feet, food, all of it, it is in the profit. And I just wanted to share that because there's, you know, people, why, should I, why should I listen to you about how? Like, I've, I've barely been trying to do it as a business and it's been successful. Where should you start? I started with babies. I believe you should start with babies because then you get to learn those specific animals. You know, get females first if you're, if you're just getting into it because those take longer to raise to breeding age. Start with the females. You get to know the snake. You get to get a feel for everything they need and what works, what doesn't. And over that time, you can build your knowledge into what you need to do to take care of these snakes properly and, and have healthy snakes. And mostly that means proper, proper environment, and that's temperatures, humidity, and learning to create that gradient. Or, or if you're doing whole room heat, that's not what I do. What I do is I have the whole room that stays between 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And with an evaporative humidifier, I keep that room at about 55% humidity, and then I can go and up the humidity in individual tubs if I need to by adding some water to the cocoa blocks, which is what I keep all of my ball pythons on. In freedom breeder tubs, you can keep that environment that they need to thrive, which is proper humidity, proper temperatures, which again, 75 to 80 degrees in the room. I like to have a hot spot of no more than 89 degrees for any individual animal, and that means I'm using a temp gun to measure the spot below the substrate, and that spot gets no hotter than 89 degrees. If it bumps up to 90, not a big deal, but I like to keep it right about 89. I could dive totally into this whole room, how I've got my room set up, but I made a whole video about how my room is set up in particular, and you can find that link right up here if you'd like to watch that video on, on how my room works. Ultrasound, and this is the one part I'd like to talk about, even though it's not something that I do. I have not made the investment into an ultrasound machine. I go more by feel. I do a lot of palpation. I like to really feel the animals and see where they're at. Would an ultrasound machine benefit my breeding? I believe absolutely it would. 
just like it would benefit this video if my neighbor would stop with the uh, leaf blower. Ultrasound would just let you know exactly where your females are at with their follicular development. I'm doing that by feel, and sometimes I miss. So sometimes I may be utilizing males in a place where it's not ideal for them to be putting out their energy to be breeding. If I was to recommend to you something to do apart from how I do it currently, it would be an ultrasound. Everything else I'm gonna talk about is something that I, I do. Now, when it comes to pairing, it's pretty much as simple as just putting two snakes together. And you have to be willing to accept that two snakes might not want to breed. You know, this male snake might not like the way the female smells and vice versa. There's little tricks you can do, like throwing another male's shed into the tub to create some, uh, you know, competition feel and it might entice that male that you want to breed that female to breed that female. You could uh, avert the hemipenes and squirt a little bit of that uh, spum or, or semen out from the uh, sperm, whatever you want to call it from the male and rub it on the female's back or maybe try it from a different male and rub it on there again to strike that competition up in that male. Um, but it's pretty much as easy as just putting the two snakes together and, and hoping they lock up. I was talking to Brian Gundy recently on Instagram Live and he talked about how he'll actually sometimes lay the male and put his cloaca right next to the female's cloaca. You maybe can take a little extra tip and just twist their tails together and <laughs> really get them close to that point to where they're going to breed. I mean, these are things you could try, but ultimately it's as easy as putting the snakes together and I think it's very important that you document which males you put with the females. I personally use a clipboard with a piece of paper. I like to go old school like that and just write it down. It's easier for me. And I put little check marks every time I put the snakes together. And then I circle those check marks every time I witness a lock between those two snakes. And that way I have a thing I can go back to and look at for which snakes bred which snakes. Through all this, I'm keeping the same temps. All that is the same. Same temps in the environment. Nothing changes. I don't bump up heat. I don't do night drops. I don't do any of that. I just keep them flat temps, the temps I mentioned earlier. Let's say you're pairing successful and you, you get a clutch from that female and the eggs are coming out and uh, it's getting wild back here, guys. I'm just gonna have to pause for a second while all this madness happens. <laughs> it's time to collect your eggs. And something I've tried recently actually is, hi, Hilo. I let mom keep the eggs and she's doing a good job and she's eaten while on the eggs, which is the main reason that I take eggs from the snakes in the first place is so that mom can get back on food sooner and hopefully be ready to breed the next season or at least get her strength back as quickly as possible. But for now, I mostly artificially incubate. So that means collecting the eggs from mom. And my simple setup is a six quart Sterilite box, lay down some perlite under that, poured with water on top, and then a light diffuser with cross stitch mesh on top of that light diffuser to hold the eggs above the incubation medium of perlite, and then put them on there, maybe some little toothpicks to keep them from rolling around, a little press and seal on top, put it on top, stick it in the incubator, which is something I inherited from a buddy of mine. It's just a repurposed uh, mini fridge with heat tape and a computer fan in there to keep the heat circulated and not have a hot spot. And I incubate at 89 degrees, 55 days roughly, until the eggs start to pip. And about a week or so before the eggs are supposed to pip, I'll start opening up that press and seal, letting them breathe because they start to desiccate a butt and let out, let out a lot of moisture. It starts to build up inside the box. So I let, the, get, let that breathe a little bit so it doesn't mold at the last stage. And speaking of mold, if I ever notice any little mold spots on any of the eggs, I'll take a little bit of Desinix, which is like a athlete's foot powder type of stuff. I'll, it's right here. I'm, you've got all these beautiful footage right here next to me while I'm talking. I use that stuff and just get a little light bit of coating on that and kind of paint it onto the moldy spot and just kind of check to make sure it doesn't continue to grow. And uh, if a snake does die in the egg and the thing becomes completely green and blue all the way throughout and it's just dead and hard, I pull that, that egg out so that it doesn't affect the rest of the eggs. After you've successfully incubated and it's been that 55 days to 60 days or whatever it takes for that first egg to pip, which is my sign that it's time to check the eggs regularly is when that first snake pips. It's a beautiful thing. It's a glorious thing. You're going to love that moment. So once they've all hatched, then that's when I'll transfer them over to one big FB8 tub and I'll let them stay together. But I wait till they all hatch because I like the snakes to crawl around and kind of entice the other snakes and let them know, hey, you know, it's, it's okay to come out of the egg. Like we're, we're out here, we're doing this. So once the very last snake comes out of the egg is when I transfer them to that FB8. And then I keep them in the FB8 on some of this paper that I get from um, CMC Reptiles. I'll link that down in the description. I'll keep them in there until they all shed out. Just like I wait till they all come out of the egg to put them into that FB8, I'll wait for them to all shed out before I start moving them to their individual tubs. That way they have each other to rub up against a little bit when they're shedding off that egg skin. And uh, that's, just, that's just how I do it. Once the last snake has shed out, then I will take all of them individually and transfer them to their own individual FB5 CV Freedom Breeder tubs. 
And the reason I use those tubs is because, as many of you may know, if you haven't known already, snakes, especially ball pythons, are quite thigmotactic, which means they like to be snug as a bug in a rug. So if there's a bunch of open space, it's going to be less likely for them to be readily ready to feed because they don't feel safe. They like tight spaces. It's hard for us humans to wrap our minds around, especially somebody like me. I like to be out on the top of a mountain, spreading my arms wide, running up and down the side of the thing. That's just not how a baby snake feels comfortable. They're not like, oh, send me out on the airplane, daddy. They're like, please put me in a little tight, dark space where I can feel secure and that nothing's going to eat me so that I can feel comfortable enough to eat something else and i get all of my snakes started on frozen thought over here have since the beginning have never fed live ever to a hatchling which people think i'm nuts for doing that but that's how i do it and that's what happens and i do it successfully because i keep them in those fb5s where they feel nice and dark and secure now let's get to that next part which is the selling of these snakes once you've bred them maybe you're not planning to sell snakes that you bred and you just want to breed some snakes for yourself that's awesome Again, if you love snakes and you, you just wanted to make your own snakes for you to keep and, and have more and not have to buy a bunch of different snakes and you just found the ones that you really liked, that's cool. I, I'd love to hear if anybody does that in the comments down below, if that's your story. If you just got a, a mommy and a daddy snake and you made your own snake babies that you now get to raise and, and they're all going to be yours, I'd love to hear that. Uh, please leave a comment down below if that's you. What I do personally, and I would recommend this to anybody, is obviously I wait for them to shed. And then I like them to have at least five meals before they go anywhere. Just to know that they're nice and nice and uh, established and they're going to be able to handle the stress of the trip to wherever they're going. And be able to make an easy transition and have a nice build of food in their belly if for some reason the stress keeps them from wanting to eat for a couple weeks or however long. Snakes can go a long time without food, but again, I like to have that solid foundation of at least five meals it's going to be better for the snake and it's going to be better for the person getting the snake from you to know they got a snake from you that was ready to thrive was already thriving and they're not going to have to stress out about too much like getting this thing to stop from uh dying or you know that it wasn't ready yet for that trip so that's the first step for me and then next is morph market Morph Market is a wonderful platform for people that are looking to sell their animals. They've really changed the game as far as selling back from the days of King Snake and Fauna Classifieds and all those different ads. And there's, I think there's still people selling on Craigslist, which seems crazy to me, but uh, I think there are. But Morph Market really keeps upping their game all the time. And that's where I put every animal that I'm going to list that makes it past the you guys reaching out from the videos or f f Patreon folks uh, getting the animals then Morph Market is where those animals go every time. And once somebody finds me through Morph Market, I always have a phone call with that person, unless I know them already, unless I know them. I don't, we don't need to have a phone call if I, if I know about your snake keeping history or if I, you know, that's the only exception. Other than that, I have a phone call. And why do I have a phone call? Because it's to protect me, it's to protect the snake, and it's to protect the customer as well and that let them know and have a conversation be able to answer any of their questions text communication is such a horrible way to communicate i believe you know it's it can be done but it's not feasible for most people and that phone call is just something to touch back to our humanity and also just feel out where they're at what my expectations are of them what their expectations are of me and get that all laid out before we even agree to enter into a transaction i've had people not want to have a phone call if somebody doesn't want to have a phone call with me I don't want them to have my snake because if you're not willing to have a phone conversation with me and talk about what's about to happen here, how can I trust you with a snake if we can't trust you to have a phone call? A phone call is such a simple thing and that happens. So that's one of my prerequisites. We need to have a phone call, figure out where we're at, talk about the snake, talk about what your plans are with the snake, where your experience level is, and just make it a more comfortable and, and better transaction to where we're not having scams. That's the other thing. If you guys that are selling snakes... Find out if it's a real person. There's always somebody out there trying to scam you, and the snake world is no exception. You get on the phone, you can get a feel for somebody a lot better than if it's just some message saying, oh, I really want this snake. I'm sure you do. And and that's about it, guys. That's uh, that's This video maybe, maybe ended up being longer than I thought it was going to be, but hopefully that was good. If you have any further questions, just leave a comment down below. Leave your own experiences so people can read through in the comments below You know all the different ideas that people have out there for breeding, and the more we can work off each other and pass ideas around the better we're going to do as a whole community so thank you again for being here i appreciate every single one of you guys for coming and watching and supporting the channel and uh yeah until next time you guys take care of yourselves take care of each other and we'll see you on the next video aloha Oh man, 
I don't know what happened. It started getting super hectic down here. Dogs and kids. My battery died in my recorder. I don't know when it stopped recording and when. I... <sighs> Hopefully, we're at where I want to be at with this video for your sake. How is this dog down here? I just closed the door. To be the perfect man.